Thanks everyone for being with us this afternoon. My name is Kelsey Goforth and I'm DWDC's Director of Programs. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Amanda coventry Barrage. Before we begin today, I want to acknowledge that while we are meeting virtually, the land dying with Dignity Canada is on is the tra traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Indigenous, Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We invite and encourage you to do your own research regarding the various treaties, in particular the land on which you're meeting with us today. I'm thrilled to welcome you to another session of Your Healthcare Team, which is a series which aims to provide you with information on the roles and responsibilities of the care providers that make up your healthcare team. Today, our session will focus on music therapists and their role in end-of-life care and how they support patients and families. Before I welcome today's speaker, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items with everyone. So everyone today is muted. However, we'd love to hear from you. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to type those into the question bar, which is on the Zoom side panel, and we'll read that out for you at the end of the session. Please try to keep your question as concise and clear as possible so we can get to as many people on the call today as we can. We will try our best to get to all the questions that come through, but we may not get to everybody. So if you do have anything outstanding, you're welcome to email us. Our email is support at dyingwithdignity.ca and we'll follow up with you. And if you do have a question that's more personal in nature, you're welcome to email us there and we can connect you with the appropriate resources and information. We will be recording the session today as well. So it will be posted to our website for anybody who, who misses the session or wants to rewatch it. We also have a webinar survey that's going to pop up after we wrap up today. So if you could take a few minutes to share your feedback with us, that would be very much appreciated. And last but not least, I'd like to take a moment to spotlight an upcoming special project that will be premiering on World Right Today this year on November 2nd. In My Own Time is a documentary that looks at what it means to die on one's own terms using firsthand accounts from people across Canada. This film will offer perspectives on medical assistance in dying, less commonly seen in media reports, and present an opportunity to educate people on end-of-life choice in Canada. On November 2nd at 7 p.m. Eastern, Dying with Dignity Canada will be hosting the premiere of In My Own Time at the Scotiabank Theatre in downtown Toronto. Uh, other screenings will be taking place across Canada throughout the month of November, so be sure to follow us on social media for updates. And we hope you can join us for uh, the Toronto screening or one of the others that we'll, we'll have taking place across the country this fall. And now to introduce today's speaker. Joining us today, we have, have Dr. Sarah Rose Black. Dr. Sarah Rose Black is a registered psychotherapist and certified music therapist, researcher and educator specializing in psychosocial oncology and palliative care at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center and in private practice. She is a graduate intern supervisor at Wilfrid Laurier University and in September of 2023, she will be an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto. Sarah Rose is the editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Music Therapy, and her research focuses on music therapy and medical, medically assisted dying, music, and psilocybin use in advanced cancer care, and music therapy for adolescents and young adults with cancer. As a pianist, vocalist, and music health educator, she has performed, taught, and presented on her clinical work and research across Canada. Thank you so much for being with us today, and I'm going to pass it over to Amanda, who's going to get us started with the interview. All right. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, thank you so much, Sarah Rose, for joining us. Um, let's go ahead and uh, dive right in. So I think for a first question, we'll get to know a little bit more about you. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your previous work in healthcare, and then what first drove you to pursue additional study in music therapy? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Kelsey, and to everyone at Dying with Dignity for hosting this. I'm so thrilled to be here. I actually started out as a music educator. That was my introduction to the world of music and health. I was very passionate about music education as a pianist, 
sort of a lifelong musician, having started music at a young age, I went into music education, sure that I was going to pursue a career as a high school music teacher. I had a private music studio where I taught piano students. And what I found was happening is in these exchanges with students, students were coming to me with more than just their musical questions and more than just their technical needs. They were coming to me with a lot of emotion and that showed up in their playing, in our interactions, in their music. And I got really curious about the relationship between music and health in the traditional piano lesson. Uh, after pursuing my Bachelor of Music Education, I started doing some volunteering at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, CAMH, just getting really curious about what it was that connected music and health. And I volunteered once a week, played the piano, no idea what I was doing, but I was on an inpatient unit. And oh my gosh, the people who were there were reactive in such an intense and profound way. Like patients were coming up to me, crying, laughing, talking, sharing, engaging. And I thought, something's going on here and I need to know more. I want to know more. I want to know how to do this with um, intention and harness this energy and this power. So that's why I went to music therapy school. And that's um, what precipitated my quest to know more about music and health. Well, thank you for sharing. I think it's surprising at least to hear that, you know, your career actually started in completely different sphere outside of healthcare and more in education and certainly a different clientele, if you will, than what you serve now. So that's super interesting. So thank you for that. Um, for our next question, this is just more of a basic for any of our audience members that uh, might not know, but what is music therapy? This is such a great question. And it's one that I find I'm answering every day, not only to the people that I serve, but for myself, because I think it shifts. The most clear cut answer is that music therapy is an approach to healthcare that supports patients, clients, people in achieving non-musical goals through music. So to break that down, I use music every day and a lot of it is live music. Actually, most of it is, but I'm always looking at clinical goals. So how can I use music to support pain management? How can I use music to support anxiety relief? How can I use music to tap into someone's emotional processes and needs, et cetera? So the three most important components of music therapy, at least in my practice, music, the clinical goal, whatever that might be based on the patient's need and the therapeutic relationship. So these three things are absolutely fundamental. I engage with people and develop that caring, trusting, I hope supportive relationship in order for them to feel safe and supported for us to dive deep into what it is they need at any given moment. And then the music is the tool. The music is like the second therapist in the room. So music, clinical goals, therapeutic relationship. Thank you for that. And I love that you said that uh, music is like the second therapist in the room. I think that ties it together beautifully. Um, for our next question, uh, how, how many music therapists exist in, in Canada? What is the program like to become a music therapist? Great question. So it's rapidly growing, which I'm very excited to share. The profession has seen like leaps and bounds and changes. As far as an actual number, I'm guessing upwards of 2000. I mean, it could be less, it could be a little bit more, but every year training programs are, um, are working with more and more people and accrediting more and more people. Music therapy is an evidence-based profession, and it's also um, a pretty rigorous profession as far as what you need to become certified. So typically, a person will come into the profession and do either an undergraduate in music therapy or a master's of music therapy. Both are options and streams to become certified. I'm finding more and more that people are tending towards a bachelor of music, a bachelor of psychology, a bachelor of science, a bachelor of anything really, but you have to come into the master's program with a certain level of musical training, as well as a certain number of psychology credits. Now I will say this is in Canada. It's a little bit different in the States, a little bit different in Europe, a little bit different in Australia. Um, but in Canada, you either do your bachelor's or your master's, you do an internship, and then you write your certification exam. So that's basically the streamlined process. Um, the internship consists of about a thousand hours of a combination of clinical work, supervision, and education. Most people do it over two years, um, like two summers or over the course of one full year. And so when uh, Kelsey mentioned that I'm a graduate supervisor, 
I train interns here at Princess Margaret. So people come into the profession from all walks of life, as long as they have pretty substantial musical background. And again, a certain number of psychology credits. Um, you can study to be a MTA, a certified music therapist, music therapist accredited is the credential, um, or a neurologic music therapist, which is a slightly different accreditation, but I hold the certification of certified music therapist. Wonderful. And just before we move on, maybe I could ask what the distinction is between those two accreditations, if you happen to know. Definitely. So in my practice, there's much more of a psychotherapy focus and an emotion focus. While I do look at physical symptoms all the time with my patients, and I do look at neurological or cognitive changes that they might experience, my expertise isn't necessarily in um, shifting someone's neurological processes the way a neurologic music therapist would focus. So an NMT, as they're called, their acronym, would look at, say, speech language patterns or cognitive behaviors or um, sensory motor activity and actually use elements of music to shift those things for, say, a stroke survivor or someone with like an acquired brain injury or someone in a rehabilitative context. So it's very rehab focused. My work is very psychotherapeutic focused. I'm very deeply focused on the relationship that we develop. Um, so there are those distinctions. And to become a neurologic music therapist, you do need to be a certified music therapist first and foremost. And then it's an additional accreditation on top of that, an NMT uh, certification. So a lot of music therapists choose that route. Um, and some actually have both and they're able to draw from both skill sets. Wonderful. Thank you for summarizing that up. Uh, for my next question, who is eligible to receive care from a music therapist? The short answer is anybody. Uh, it's really beautiful to see that music therapists work with people at all points of the lifespan. So I like to say any age, any stage. Music therapists work in facilities and institutions, like I'm, I'm sitting here at Princess Margaret where I work, uh, but also in private practice, which I also have in the community, in uh, the school system, in correctional facilities. And then within those institutions or community practices, there's lots of different options. So anything from neonatal intensive care to geriatric care, palliative care, end of life at, at any stage, at any age. And as far as eligibility, it really depends on the client's or the patient's interest, openness, curiosity. Here at Princess Margaret, the people who are referred to music therapy are typically patients who are struggling with pain and symptom management, anxiety, coping with being in the hospital, overwhelm, mood management, um, the stress of dealing with chronic or advanced illness. You do not have to have any musical experience whatsoever to participate in music therapy. I'm going to say that one more time. It is so important. Nobody needs to have any musical experience to come into a music therapy session. And the key component of why that is, is because human beings are intrinsically musical. By virtue of being alive, you have an instrument in your body 100% of your lifespan, your heart. The way we move through the world is rhythmic. We react to our sound environment. Our auditory system is the first thing to develop as we are developing it in the womb. It is the last sense to go when someone is dying. We are intrinsically musical beings. So anyone who is interested in using music to deepen their sense of self-awareness or to achieve a clinical goal is eligible for music therapy. Wonderful. Thank you. That was such a beautiful way to put it as well. All right. For follow-up question, I think this is quite obvious that someone would ask. So how can someone get in touch with or be referred to a music therapist? Great question. So if somebody is navigating the hospital system, there's often a music therapist in a hospital system. Not always. That's changing. There are more and more of us. But um, here at Princess Margaret, I just encourage patients to, they can self-refer, they can ask their nurse, um, they can ask their physician, any member of the healthcare team. But if someone's, you know, in community and looking for music therapy to support their needs or the needs of a loved one, it's fairly straightforward to go through the Music Therapy Association of Ontario. Um, I think it's musictherapyontario.com. But in any case, if you Google Music Therapy Association of Ontario, you can actually get directed to a referral page where you can type in your area um, geographically and who you're looking for and a number of options will pop up. 
you can always get in touch with me. I'm always happy to direct people. Um, and the Canadian Association of Music Therapists is another excellent place to get information. That's an easy one, musictherapy.ca. And there's a wealth of information there. But um, yeah, I, I encourage people to reach out as well to me if, uh, if that's helpful at all. Um, I'm happy to direct people. But Google is probably the best bet, musictherapy.ca. Well, thank you for that. And what would be a good way for folks to get in touch if they do have questions? Yeah, I'm happy to leave my email in the chat or share it at the end, whatever you think is best, Amanda. Wonderful. Maybe we can include that in the chat. We'd include in a follow-up email for all folks who are interested. Thank you so much for offering um, your expertise to those who might be interested. So wonderful. All right, so we're actually going to break down more into what actually looks, what a session looks like um, day to day. So for my next question, in your practice, you integrate psychotherapy as well as music therapy into your care for patients. Can you break down what exactly a session might look like? Absolutely. So in my work here at the Cancer Center, I always start with an assessment and a getting to know the person I'm with. What are their needs? How are they coping? How have they been dealing with what they are faced with? What's the role of music in their life? So I ask a number of questions that I have that help me better understand who a person is and what their needs might be. So we start with a conversation. And then as far as the musical interventions that I might use, I like to offer a number of different things. So that could include receptive music therapy, where I would be playing the music and the patient would be essentially receiving it or um, just active listening, like being present and taking the music in. And I'm using music very specifically to either manage their breathing. Like I might use music at a specific tempo or speed to slow their breathing down. I might use familiar music to them um, as a source of comfort or reflection or catharsis or nostalgia. People can get quite emotional when they listen to music that is meaningful. And I love getting to know people through music because every single one of us, regardless of our cultural background or um, how we were raised, we have a soundtrack to our lives that's made up of all the sounds, the songs, the experiences we've had musically throughout our lives, whether intentional or not. And I like getting to know people in that sense. What's your musical DNA? What's your musical fingerprint? So I might do some receptive music therapy. That's pretty common in the hospital when people are quite medically unwell and maybe don't have the energy to engage. But a lot of people want to talk. They want to share what comes up as they're listening to the music. So that's where my psychotherapy comes in. I ask very specific questions around experience, images, thoughts, body sensations. Where are you at? What are you feeling? How is that informing how you're coping, et cetera? But the cool thing is if people want to engage a little bit differently, I do songwriting with people all the time. Nobody has to have any experience with songwriting, but it can be a beautiful way to express one's feelings, leave a legacy for somebody. So often patients who know that they are dying, who have maybe a, a short prognosis, we might actually write a song for a loved one, for their kids, for a spouse, for a friend, for themselves. And I guide the songwriting process based on the patient's story and the patient's um, vision for the song. So I guide that. Patients sometimes play. Either they have a musical background and they want to play a specific instrument, which I can provide them with. Occasionally, they might have one with them. That's not uncommon. Um, it might be comforting for someone to bring their guitar to the hospital, even if they don't play a lot. Sometimes I encourage people to use their breath and their voice, and I do some guided humming, guided singing for breath support, for oxygenation, um, for relaxing in the nervous system. And we do lyric analysis and we do um, prescribed playlists. So there might be something coming up that they want a specific playlist for. I will guide them through creating that. And, and on and on it goes. So it really, it totally depends on what the patient needs and wants. And then I offer a number of suggestions. Thank you for that. I find it so interesting that you can change just very tiny aspects of how you deliver your care and it can really provide such a different um, outcome and, and provide such a different tailored experience for each patient. So wonderful. So I know we've uh, mentioned before that you work there at, at Princess Margaret, but you also have your private practice. So for my next question, what kind of patients typically seek out your services? 
great question. So I see a lot of people for traditional sort of talk psychotherapy. Maybe traditional isn't the right word, but if people want verbal psychotherapy to process their experience of chronic or advanced illness, uh, managing anxiety, managing depression, managing big life transitions or big shifts in their experience, grief and loss, uh, they might come into my private practice. And typically, if someone's seeking out psychotherapy, then yes, we go with the talk psychotherapy model. But I like having music as a tool in the background where I can maybe offer a suggestion for music as a form of mindfulness or relaxation, in addition to the work we do in talk psychotherapy. So people who might seek me out in private practice may be people who are living with long-term chronic illness and perhaps um, have have gained access to support through a hospital system, but there often is a cap on how much support a hospital can give somebody if they are, say, an outpatient. It really, it depends on the hospital system and some people prefer longer term therapy. So they might seek out private practice. Um, some people might look for um, a space away from a healthcare system, like at a community clinic that might be not connected to the place where they have to go for say chemotherapy or treatment. Um, or I might see couples together who are interested in exploring aspects of their relationship through both talk therapy and music therapy. In my private practice, I don't see children, but I will see teens, young adults, and then up through um, older adults. But a lot of people in private practice will focus their attention on say kids um, living on the, with the, on the autism spectrum. Um, kids dealing with various diagnoses or struggling with different mental health concerns. Uh, it might be helpful to have a longer term therapist in private practice versus in the traditional healthcare, public health care system. Wonderful. Thank you. And before we move on, I just wanted to touch on um, one aspect of, of the care you provide or for those that are um, suffering loss or experiencing grief. And I just wanted to to ask if there's you know any lessons learned or any wisdom that you kind of gleaned while you've been supporting patients. That is such a lovely question. I think the short answer is yes. It's been such a privilege to be able to have a window into people's world when they are experiencing the complexity of what life can bring as far as joy, loss, grief, overwhelm, change. They're often told your patients are your greatest teachers. And that's absolutely true. It could not be more true. I find that people all the time, especially at the cancer center, will reflect on how important it is to stay in the moment, how important it is to do something now, don't wait, which, you know, sometimes that's feasible, sometimes that's not, but it's a beautiful lesson to keep in the back of one's mind to really seize the moment. And to appreciate and to just be so full of gratitude every day, I find it's so, um, it shines a light on how grateful we can be for so much, even though uh, there can be so much suffering. And that comes down to human connection, support and care. I watch as you know nurses provide such tender care to patients. And this patient who is profoundly suffering is so deeply grateful for that exchange and might share that, you know, that's what gets them through their day. So those moments are real life lessons that it's the connections we make, the care we give for each other, the gratitude we can hold that really, that's really the, the best part of life. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, for my next question, you've already touched on this quite a bit. Maybe if you want to dive in a little bit deeper um, for this question, how can music and music therapy treat or bring comfort to patients? Lovely. So as far as treatment, I'm often referred to people who are perhaps dealing with complex pain. So I'll start there with the physical um, and then I'll move to the emotional and perhaps the psychosocial aspects. If somebody's dealing with complex pain, they're going to be on a pain medicine regimen. But in addition to that, it's often helpful to have something non-pharmacological. So not medicine, but something that they can experience without having to take a pill. So I might go in and use music to slow their breathing down. And that does a number of things. If we slow our breathing down, our heart rate can go down. If we can slow our heart rate down, our bodies can relax. And effectively what I'm working on 
is engaging the parasympathetic nervous system. When we are under threat, perceived or real, or when we are experiencing intensity in the form of pain, our sympathetic nervous system can flare up, that fight or flight response, fight, flight, freeze. And that can actually add to somebody's distress or the intensity of the pain. But when music can be offered, especially live music, in that context, with great care and intention and skill, you can actually slow someone's heart rate down through the style and tempo of your music. Sometimes I do a bit of guided work with my uh, with my words, but often it's just the music. And we're working on sending a signal to the brain to say, you are safe, you are safe. And to actually slow the heart rate down can actually change someone's perception of their pain. This doesn't always happen right away, but it's certainly something that we are taught to do in music therapy school, which is quite powerful. It can also be a great comfort for family members to know that there's this sonic blanket, this sonic hug that is wrapped around their loved one that might be familiar music or it just might be soothing, comforting, and improvisation. So that's one. Oh, hi there, folks. I think uh, Sarah Rose is having a little bit of technical difficulty. We're just going to hold tight for a second and make sure that everything is okay. Hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Wonderful. You're back. Welcome back. I uh, just want to make sure everything's okay. No, that's all right. Technical issues. It happens. Yes, so go on. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah. So we were talking about the physical perception of pain and how music can affect that. But as far as treatment emotionally and looking at things like anxiety, often music can tap into an emotion that a patient doesn't even realize that they're holding. So I might play a familiar song and a patient might actually become quite tearful. And what's so powerful about that is it can actually help release an emotion that they've been holding on to or give them um, some perspective. Like I didn't realize I needed that really good cry. And here's who that made me think of. And here's a memory that came up for me. And you actually unlock parts of a person through a very, I call it the secret highway to the heart. Music goes in and it unlocks parts of us in a safe and supportive way. So that can actually be quite cathartic and quite healing for a person to tap into their feelings that may have otherwise gone unaddressed. And certainly there's a social aspect of healing when we engage with music with loved ones. I'll often do sessions with family members, um, whether they're present in the room quietly or they're present in singing or they're present in telling stories and reflecting. That um, guided nostalgia, that guided reminiscence can be healing for um, a community, a family, a dyad, a group, a chosen family, a biological family to be able to connect not just through words, but with the prompt of music and to be able to reflect on the things that are important and meaningful, that can be hugely healing, especially when someone is facing terminal illness. And it can be really hard to talk about things just without any prompting or any guidance. So that's part of my role as well. Wonderful. And just before we move on, I wanted to touch on, you know, most of your clients are obviously going to be the ones experiencing, you know, perhaps a life limiting illness, or again, you know, significant changes in their life, um, or grief or loss. But I'm just wondering, you know, could someone, for example, like a caregiver for somebody that's experiencing those things also benefit from music therapy? Absolutely, absolutely. I see caregivers in my private practice um, fairly often, especially because there is so much that is being held, anticipatory grief, um, fear of the unknown, uncertainty, what is my life going to look like? What has my life looked like caregiving? How am I going to cope? There's so much unknown and it can be quite grounding to engage um, in music therapy and psychotherapy. In my work at Princess Margaret, um, because I just feel there's a little bit of a limitation sometimes around I'm the only music therapist at Princess Margaret. I wish I could have more a more robust caregiver program, but I'm able to do that more in my private practice. And also I'm hoping to run some grief support groups for caregivers uh, in the future. But certainly music therapists in general work with caregivers regularly, whether individually or in groups. Wonderful. Thank you. For my next question, we're going to kind of dive back into, again, the session itself. Um, what kinds of music and instruments do you typically use during a session? Is each session different or are there commonalities? There are commonalities in as far as what the music therapist is comfortable using or what the patient 
asks for um, or suggests. And a lot of music therapists are multi-instrumentalists. I tend to lean pretty heavily on a few. So I'm a pianist first and foremost. I'm also a singer. So I lean pretty heavily on those two, but I've got lots of like smaller auxiliary percussion. Um, you can see the ukuleles in the background, obviously my keyboards. Uh, I'm not, I'm really not a very good guitar player, but um, a lot of my students are excellent guitar players. And so they might use guitar, uh, mandolin. I have Tibetan singing bowls that I use. I have an ocean drum that sounds like ocean waves. I have various percussion instruments that patients can play that can be accessible, but also quite soothing as far as their timbre or their texture. So it depends on what the patient wants. First and foremost, I give a bunch of options. Um, occasionally I'll bring my violin in, which I do play, but not very often. Um, largely because it's difficult to sanitize. Like I won't bring my violin into a room where someone's under isolation protocols. Um, Pre-COVID that was a little bit easier, but uh, now there's just more and more isolation. So I asked the patient, like, where do you want to go today? What do you want to feel while you're listening to the music? That's my favorite question to ask. And they will tell me, and if they're not sure, I'll give suggestions, but I tend pretty heavily towards vocals, keyboard and auxiliary percussion so smaller like drums and chimes and bells wonderful and that actually ties into my follow-up question are there certain instruments or you know genres of music that you use for specific outcomes and you kind of spoke to that already with changing things like tempo um, or using certain instruments um, so maybe if you could just dive a little bit more into it certainly so again, it does come down to patient preference, but I love asking people, again, not for a favorite song, but tell me about the role of music in your life. Tell me about what draws you in about certain types of music. Do you have a favorite style, genre, artist? What's the last song you listened to? If you were to seek out any type of music, what would it be? What was the last concert you were at? So I... I obviously have sort of my repertoire that I'm comfortable with, but I'm always open to learning new pieces from patients. So they might say, hey, have you heard of this band? Have you heard of this composer? And we get into a great dialogue about it. I will learn music for patients. That's also part of my role. But I love pulling something up on Spotify and listening with the patient and then discussing, like, what did that bring up for you? Where did you go while you were listening? Let's talk about what that piece means to you. So... It's pretty diverse. Like I, I'm, I feel grateful that I've had training in several different styles of music, but I also love to learn and love to hear from patients. I had a patient just the other day um, play an instrument that was something I had never heard before from his country of origin. And he had it in the hospital with him and he taught me all about this instrument. And I've had patients teach me folk songs in their, um, in their native language, uh, in their first language rather. And that's been really beautiful because even if someone doesn't speak English as their primary language, we can still engage and I can still learn and I can also share my music as well. And certainly music is a language in and of itself. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. Um, for this next interview question, we're going to talk a little bit more now about the patients themselves. And I wanted to ask, is there a particular story or lesson learned from a time that you had spent with a patient during a music therapy session that you'd like to touch on? That's so lovely. And it's uh, one of those questions where I feel a flood of answers coming into my mind. <laughs> There's so many beautiful stories and learnings and gifts that patients have offered just by virtue of inviting me, as I say, into their hospital room, but also into their lives or in private practice, just inviting me into their experience. I think that courage and honesty is such a beautiful thing to witness when somebody takes a chance on something that might be unfamiliar. So the patient who proverbially has never played a note or sung a note in their lives and is sort of terrified of it, but is willing to try or willing to engage in music, not knowing what it will bring. One of my favorite stories to share is of uh, a young man who really, really wanted to learn the violin and he knew he didn't have a lot of time left to live. He was post bone marrow transplant, which unfortunately um, the treatment didn't work. And the doctor said, you know what? We think you have a few months left to live. So this wonderful patient who I'd worked with for quite a long time said, well, I want to learn the violin. 
And I was a little bit taken aback because for anybody who plays a stringed instrument, any instrument at all, it takes a fair bit of time to really master the instrument and create a sound. But I went with it. I said, okay, tell me why you want to learn the violin. That's fantastic. And he very sweetly said, well, I want to play it for my wife. I want to play the song that she walked down the aisle to on our wedding day. And I want that to be the gift for her. And I'll tell you what, we made it work. We made it work. I I took the melody on the violin and I helped him with his violin, which he went ahead and bought, which was so beautiful. And he had the courage and the strength and the bravery to put that violin up on his shoulders and bow an open string, which was all he needed to do. And that courage, that bravery, taking a chance on something and in the hopes that it creates legacy, it creates healing, it creates beauty that is so powerful to witness. Wonderful. That's a beautiful story. Um, and maybe just a, a follow-up question to that. I'm just curious if um, you've ever worked with a patient that maybe already had some experience in music or already was a musician um, and still sought out your care. Definitely. Definitely. It's interesting. It's a mix. I I work with a lot of professional musicians or music students, but sometimes people who are admitted to the hospital who are musicians may be a little reluctant to engage in music therapy. And what I've learned over the years is that's because it's just so deeply connected with their sense of identity. And there's a sense of loss if they can no longer do what they used to do in the same way. But I see that as an opportunity for discussion, for healing, for therapy. Like, let's let's dig into that. Of course, not every patient wants to do that. But to just take it back a notch, yes, I see a lot of professional musicians or, mus- or people who um, are engaged in music non-professionally, but love it and play an instrument or are passionate about attending concerts. And I have walked into rooms and seen instruments in the room. Um, Patients sometimes just get really excited. Like, can I play you this song? I haven't played the guitar in so long, but I want to play because you're here. And there's music in the hospital or setting a patient up with the help of my physiotherapy colleagues in front of my keyboard because they haven't touched a keyboard in a really long time. And that's very special. And I can think of one one very young man on our palliative care unit years ago who used to play the saxophone and he was so unwell and really, really struggling with um, abdominal pain as a result of his pancreatic cancer. But he said, Sarah Rose, I used to play the saxophone and I want to play again. Like, I really want to go out with a bang. He said to me, can we get a saxophone in here? My beautiful colleagues um, at Long and McQuaid over on Bloor Street were like, yep, we can get you a saxophone. Sure enough, I watched this young man put his saxophone together and it took a lot of time. It took a lot of effort, but he did. He put his alto sax together and put his reed in and he held it up, hospital gown at the edge of his bed and just wailed on it for like five seconds. Like the entire palliative care unit, I think. Was like, what was that? And he was so happy and he put it down and he said, that was amazing. <laughs> so it's so lovely to uh, to see kind of the range from people who are more physically well and able to or less physically well, but still able to and still passionate about that part of their identity. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, for my next question, again, more patient focused. Have you ever provided care to someone at their end of life and, you know, immediate end of life? And what was their experience like? This is a very... Um, a beautiful question and something very dear to my heart because a lot of my work is with people who are right at the end of life. And in fact, my doctoral research was entirely on music therapy and medical assistance in dying. I started it right at the outset of the legalization of MAID in Canada and actually changed my thesis topic to to look at the experience of people who were receiving MAID and having music therapy. So in a nutshell, I worked with 10 participants who um, had all requested MAID and eight of them received MAID and I was with them at the bedside during that time and two of them died um, with before they actually were able to receive MAID. But um, aside from medical assistance in dying, yes, I am often with people who are right at the end of life, um, whether that's in the palliative care unit or in a different unit in the hospital or at the hospice I used to work at for a number of years. And I do a number of things. If I've known that patient for a while, I might know what their musical preferences are. If their family or friends or loved ones are with them, they might know and are able to guide me. So I might play with or for the patient. 
I might do some breath work as well in guiding their breathing. And in fact, the breath will sync up with the music that I play subconsciously. So I've seen it many, many times where a patient will be breathing in a certain way. And then with the addition of music at a certain tempo, the breath actually matches the tempo of the music and I can slow it down, which can be quite a comforting thing for families to watch, especially if someone's breathing is labored. I often like to provide familiar music and encourage family and friends and loved ones at the bedside to remember that often the patient can hear us. Very often, this is something that they are comforted by. Like, yeah, talk to them, sing to them, be with them. It's very, very possible they can hear us. So I am with people often in those last moments and then with the family in the moments after someone has died, um, which can, I, I often keep the music going at the patient's or family's request. Um, and sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm there just as a support, as somebody who can give a hug or hold someone's hand or offer a Kleenex. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I, you know, certainly thank you so much for, for supporting those families during such a moment. Um, it sounds like the, uh, the efforts that you made really, really supported them and comforted them. So, all right. Well, that time went very quickly. We're actually at the end of our formal interview. So thank you so much for answering those questions. We have lots of questions coming in from the audience. So thank you so much to our audience members. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. And for anybody else that hasn't submitted a question yet, please go ahead and put them in the, the, uh, the Q&A panel. So let's see here what we've got. All right, so for first question from our audience member asks, is there any kind of music that you stay away from while offering therapeutic sessions? Fantastic question. We know that music can cause harm. Um, it's not one particular type of music, but it's music because it's so powerful and if it's used, I think unintentionally, um, or if it's used without support, I mean, I unfortunately have seen it where it's say in long-term care, somebody may put headphones on someone and walk away. I mean, that can be quite damaging. There is no one particular genre or style that I stay away from specifically, but again, it comes down to the patient's preference. Like they might tell me. I once worked with a professional singer who said, I want you here. I want you to sing. Do not sing anything I'm going to recognize because that will be too painful. So that person just guided me and I purely stuck to improvisation. I didn't do anything pre-written or familiar. Uh, but I also, sometimes we don't know, right? And I'll play something and it will be upsetting for a patient. But that as a therapist is an opportunity for me to ask, okay, what's happening there for you? And do you want to talk a little bit about what happened there? Or do we want to just stay away completely? So I just, it all comes down to taking the patient's lead, but no, no specific song or genre or artist that I stay away from. Thank you. Thanks to our audience member for submitting that question. All right, let's take a look. Okay, um, this audience member says, it sounds like your role is incredibly fulfilling, but difficult at times. What is the most challenging part of being a music therapist? Oh, great question, a great question. Sometimes it can be quite isolating. And yes, it can be heavy to, um, to carry the stories and to be present for life's most tender and vulnerable moments. I lean very heavily on the staff that I work with, my colleagues. Um, for example, like the palliative care staff, they totally get it. They're there at the bedside too. We're all in it together. But as I said, I'm the only music therapist here and that can feel isolating. Also when there's a lot of misperception, misconceived notions of what music therapy is. And with a lot of love, sometimes when I'm walking around the hospital, people will make comments like, They'll see my keyboard and say, oh my God, what a fun job. Or where's the party? Or where's the concert? <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, it stands to reason that you would think that if you saw a musical instrument, but I can often feel isolated because the work can feel quite vulnerable. And when there's a lot of misperception of it, it's a lot to advocate and to educate. And sometimes that piece can be a bit um, overwhelming. But uh, at the end of the day, there's so much that is fulfilling. It, it does balance it out. And I do seek a lot of my own support around those isolating moments. Yeah. And I was, I was actually going to ask that as a follow-up question for you and your colleagues, both at Prin Princess Margaret, as well as in your private practice, how do you manage, you know, your own grief or your own, um, your own overwhelming feelings when you perhaps work with a patient that then dies um, or that no longer seeks out your care or that, you know, a very memorable story or, um, you know, something significant. How do you manage that? Totally. A lot of my own supervision, a lot of my own therapy, um, a lot of my own processing and 
uh, doing my own work on the feelings that come up and not avoiding them. Although, let me tell you, like, to be honest, we all go through ebbs and flows, I think, of um, avoidance or, uh, you know, I've had moments that have that I haven't been coping in a healthy way, but um, really kind of coming back to self-awareness around, okay, what do I need right now? Am I feeling burnt out? Why is that? Where can I find support? I have incredible family and friends that I lean on heavily too, but um, professionally, a lot of my own supervision and support. And as you both know, I love to run and I find that physical (laughs) release is really, really, really important to me as well. Yes. Sarah Rose had mentioned just before we started that she's going to be in an upcoming marathon. Um, I believe it's next weekend, you said? It's this Sunday. Yeah, It's this Sunday. Amazing. So I wish you good luck with that. Um, And I just want to actually touch on something else that you had mentioned in your answer about misconceptions about music therapy and therapists. And, you know, one of them, of course, associating instruments with joy, but maybe not seeing the 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 emotional kind of impact that it can have on you as the therapist. And I just wonder if there are any other misconceptions um, about your practice. Certainly, um, I've often been um, considered and with great respect to volunteers that, oh, you must be a volunteer who comes in and plays music. And while that is an important piece here, we do have volunteers coming in to play music in, in more public spaces in the hospital. Absolutely. And we have paid artists coming in as well. Um, those are important, but I think it, it, it can feel um, hard when you, you do have to spend a lot of time and a lot of years training to be at the bedside in order to provide safe and ethical care. Cause that's the foundation of what I do is, you know, it, it, the care has to be safe and ethical. So sometimes it can feel hard to be misperceived. Um, however, I do, I do advocate for music in the hospital in all ways, but um, yeah, I think just the, the time that goes into to training to become a music therapist is important too. Absolutely. Thank you, audience member, for that question. Um, For our next question here, we actually have a fellow certified music therapist in the audience. Um, So they ask, I know, yeah, wave hello. Um, They say, I am also a certified music therapist working in acute and hospice palliative care in Vancouver. So thank you so much for joining us from BC. Um, In your experience, what music is the most effective for pain management? And the audience member says, the research I've encountered suggests it's loud and up-tempo music that provides the best distraction from pain. However, in my own experience, it's music that is familiar or that has a personal connection for the patient that works best. And she's asking what your opinion is or what you found. Thanks for that question. And hello, fellow music therapists. It's lovely to connect. Um, I think you nailed it. I think it, in my practice, at least it comes down to patient preference, because what might be hugely therapeutic for one patient might be very different for another when it comes to pain management. Um, My example of the professional musician who didn't want to hear anything familiar versus yesterday, um, a gentleman in his 70s was like heavy metal. It's got to be heavy metal. (laughs) You just never know. I like to lean on improvisation for pain management, um, but if a patient is is guiding me towards familiar music, then absolutely that's what I'll use. So at the end of the day, I think it all comes down to what a patient prefers. Um, so there is sort of no, it's very difficult to do research in this area, I think, because everyone's experience is so subjective. But I love that you said that in your experience, this is what you found. And I would continue to lean into that because at the end of the day, our patients really are our greatest teachers. So I I hope that's helpful. I hope so too. I'm sure it is. Thanks to our audience member and fellow music therapist for submitting that question. All right, uh, here we go. Next question. This audience member asks, are there any elements of music therapy that a person can do on their own in their own homes? Oh, love it. Yes, absolutely. Great question. I think that um, we can often be passive music listeners, which can be wonderful and helpful. I do it too. I have music on in the background, but to actively select music to match your mood or to shift your mood, that would be my number one go-to. So let me break that down for a moment. Checking in with how you're feeling. If you're feeling really sad about something and goodness knows the weight, the state of the world right now, there's, there's a lot of grief and there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of despair. I think there's a heaviness Um, it can be quite empathic to choose music that sounds the way your feelings feel, essentially, as one of my professors would say. So if I'm feeling heavy and sad, I might actually choose a piece of music that is heavy and sad because that empathy 
can feel very comforting. Like the music gets it. The other option in active listening and active choosing of music is to, to shift your mood. Okay, I'm feeling heavy and sad. I need something to lift me out of it. I'm going to choose music intentionally that I know makes me smile. I know my toes are going to start tapping or I'm going to have a 10 second dance party. And gosh, that really makes a difference. Um, I also, here's another one. It can feel really good to send someone a song. And we can do this more easily with technology, kind of like we might send someone a letter, we might send someone a text, I'm thinking about you, try sending someone a song, here's a song that made me think of you, and that mutual exchange, and then maybe ask for a song in return, what song do you want me to hear today, can actually be a beautiful relational um, form of connection. So those are two things I'm thinking of. Wonderful. Thank you. And maybe just as a follow-up question that um, that was brought up just from this audience member here, um, but you know, in your practice, or do you know of any other music therapists that offer their services maybe to somebody who can't travel and might need to receive care or treatments at home, or are there any virtual alternatives? Yes, yes. Um, not in any way to plug my practice. We do have virtual <laughs> music therapy. Um, and also there are lots of music therapists practicing who offer virtual music therapy, which was really a result of the pandemic. There was a little bit of it beforehand, but depending on what province you're in, your music therapy association within your province would have like a similar website or portal where you can access a list of music therapists. And usually they indicate whether they have virtual offerings or in-person offerings. But um, in short, yes, there are options for virtual music therapy. Wonderful. Thank you to our audience member for that question. All right, next up, uh, this audience member actually asked this question, and this is kind of similar to what we just touched on, but just in case you have anything else to add, um, they ask, aside from private practice and in a hospital setting, where else do music therapists work? Great question. Anywhere where there are people with concerns or needs or looking for support with their mental, physical, or emotional health. So it could be like a community day program in uh, a hospice. It could be, like I mentioned, a correctional facility. There are often music therapists who go into correctional facilities and do and run groups um, around coping, around stress management, around emotional support. It could be in uh, a school system, like alongside maybe a caseworker or a social worker. There may also be a music therapist there doing work with individuals who are needing a bit of additional support. I've seen groups in um, youth family shelters, women's shelters, uh, support for uh, refugee communities, whether that's in a community center or somewhere like the YWCA um, or any kind of facility like, uh, say, I don't know if this would translate across Canada, but like a Gilda's Club or a, like a cancer support community um, that isn't a hospital and it's not a community center, but it's geared for free care for individuals living with cancer. Um, so places like that, anywhere where people are going to get support, you may find a music therapist. I'm actually so glad you brought up that answer. We had a previous webinar just a few weeks ago where we talked about supports for those impacted by cancer. And we actually spoke to somebody from Wellspring, Alberta, and one of their programs does incorporate music. So there you go. Perfect. Wow. Gold star answer. <laughs> All right, thank you to, to that audience member for that question. Um, next up, this is more about um, with cost and access. Um, so in Canada, does uh, is music therapy covered by public health insurance or if not, is it something that could be covered by something like private health insurance? Great question. And actually it popped into my head earlier in our conversation and I had, had meant to circle back to it. If you're seeing a certified music therapist you're typically going to have to pay out of pocket unless they are an employee of a hospital. Like the patients at Princess Margaret access music therapy at no cost. However, however, because I am also a registered psychotherapist, my combination of roles and the fact that I use psychotherapy in my music therapy practice mean that my patients, my clients can um, have their care covered through extended health benefits, through insurance, so they do not have to pay out of pocket. So if your music therapist is also a registered psychotherapist, then you're covered if you have extended health benefits or insurance, um, or if you're in a community center or um, a place like a hospital, which hopefully we don't have to be, but if you find yourself there, services are usually covered. Um, and we're hoping that that will just grow and change and that you can see a music therapist one day and it will be covered. So that's the direction we're going in. 
Yes, I hope so too. And thank you so much for that tip as well um, about uh, the addition of, of your psychotherapy in your practice, kind of allowing people to still access it through their private health insurance. So that's a great tip for anybody that might be interested. Um, so definitely take a look at the websites that Sarah Rose had mentioned um, and see if you can find somebody that offers that combination. So thank you for that question, audience member. Um, all right. This audience member asks a question about music therapy and the risk of falling. So quite interesting. They ask, can music therapy help with things such as balance or risk of falling. Um, they, they cite things like, you know, for example, multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's or other balance issues with the brain. Um, in your experience, do you, do you know of any, um, do you know of any cases where that's helped? What a lovely question. So yes, is the short answer, but I have a caveat that I, I can't speak to the research on it specifically with falls or fall risks but I can speak to the research on individuals who are dealing with Parkinson's or gait or mobility challenges that might compromise their balance, that when they work with a music therapist who specifically targets their gait through the use of music or the use of tempo, they can actually rehabilitate their gait to be more balanced. So yes is the short answer. Um, and I don't know specifically around uh whether there are statistics around whether falls are prevented, but I would, I would guess yes. And I know for sure that music therapists can work on balance and gait control for sure. Incredible. So it's not only just about the emotional aspect um, or the psychosocial, but there's actual physical uh, benefits that can be derived. So amazing. Definitely. Thank you, audience member, for that question. Um, and this is actually a similar one as a follow up here. Our audience member asks, is there a relationship between music, music therapy and those that might experience capacity eroding conditions like Alzheimer's, for example? Um, you know, does music therapy in a way engage them better or does it help them um, in some way or format? Absolutely. And again, such a lovely question. These are fantastic. Um, yes. So while I, I have a little bit of knowledge around the role of music in the brain, uh, it's not my area of expertise, but what I do know is that music exists in multiple areas of our brain. There's not one area that lights up when we listen to music. It's multiple areas. Um, the motor cortex, the auditory cortex, the hippocampus, the amygdala, all of these areas are shown to have increased activity when we are listening to music, particularly familiar music. But what we've seen in the research is individuals with any kind of cognitive challenges or shifts like dealing with Alzheimer's, dementia, memory impairment, they can often access memories through music, say, remember the lyrics to a song, although they may be compromised in remembering other daily facts or people around them. And we believe that that's because um, there's actually a different pathway to that information in the brain through music, rather than if I'm sitting here saying, do you remember the lyrics to Can't Help Falling in Love? Let's try speaking the lyrics together. That's a very different experience for someone's brain versus if I said, can we sing that song by Elvis and I start to play it on the piano? It's a different pathway through the brain, which accesses information in a different way, which is so promising and encouraging, especially for family members and loved ones witnessing that ability shift. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And uh, we're actually out of time for today, but I do have just one follow-up question for myself. I'd like to know what is your favorite instrument to use or your, you know, your personal favorite? Oh, so lovely. Um, you know, my, my gut reaction is, well, the piano, like it's my, it's my first instrument, my first love, but I've really come to love using my voice and the power of connecting through one's voice, the sonic experience, the vibration in the room. When I use my voice, when a patient uses their voice with me, I love to sing. And that's something that's developed over time. I didn't always love to sing. I was very, very shy and nervous about my voice, um, but it's come to be just such a human experience to express myself through my voice and then to engage with people in that way. So um, I'd have to say my voice is probably my favorite instrument. Wonderful, wonderful. And again, just before we go, I just wanted to ask again what those associations were if people want to look up um, uh, their music therapists in their province or again across Canada. Just one more time, that website that you mentioned for the, the you know, the province or the nationwide um, association. 100%. Thank you for reminding me. Musictherapy.ca is where you're going to want to go for the Canadian Association of Music Therapists. And that is a portal to all the provincial associations, depending on where you are. So musictherapy.ca 
If you get stuck, if you Google Music Therapy Canada, you're going to find what you need. If you Google music therapy in your province, you're also going to find what you need. But I would I would encourage you to visit musictherapy.ca. Is it helpful? I'm more than happy to leave my my email address. Can I do that just if people want to reach out? Yeah, certainly. If you want to include that in the chat, and maybe we can include that as well in our follow-up email to our registrants. Again, thank you so much for, for offering your time to answer folks' questions. Thank you so much, Amanda and Kelsey, and to your organization for reaching out. It's it's such a pleasure to be here with you. And thank you, audience, for the excellent, excellent questions. Yes, I know. Our audience never fails. Um, all right. So just as I said, thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Webinars like this one and all our other compassionate services are provided free of charge to Canadians navigating end of life, their loved ones, and their healthcare providers. To enable us to continue providing these services, we'd like to ask that you please consider making a charitable donation and we're going to put the link in the chat for anybody else that would like to donate and once again thank you thank you so much to everybody that joined us today thank you so much sarah rose and i wish everybody a pleasant afternoon thank you so much take care everyone all the best yes. all the best thank you everybody and bye-bye